Bridge Industries at Mayfield shipped out $20,000 worth of its shaving cabinets bound for Papua New Guinea. It's a market the company believes could be worth up to half a million dollars annually. The cabinet is fully manufactured and assembled by Bridge with Australian made parts. 18 months ago the shaving cabinet production line was storage space. Now it employs a full-time staff that could rise by 16 if the company's overseas venture comes off. It's taken 12 months of negotiations with major overseas agent Burns Fulk to get the New Guinea exports off the ground. The company already sells half a million dollars worth of the cabinets in Australia and they're also looking at Hong Kong, New Zealand, Singapore and Fiji. At this stage though, the New Guinea deal involves a continuing order of $15,000 of the cabinets a month on top of the $20,000 first lot. And according to Tim Bridge, that's good news for this area. Well, we're trying to use as many local manufactured parts as possible, uh, right down to the tool making people who are locally located. Uh, we're using local staff, local transport. It's most important to us. Set on beachfront land at Kalaroo Road, Redhead, the Nine Mile Beach Caravan Park is an attempt to create the caravan owner's ideal of heaven. Its comprehensive features were inspected today by Lake Macquarie Mayor Alderman Jeff Pasterfield, State Member for Charlestown Richard Face, Chairman of the Hunter Development Board Alex Young, and Peter Belitho from the Hunter and Lower North Coast Tourist Authority. The completed development will consist of 134 concrete caravan sites, many of them served by their own bathroom and toilet. Even the large communal bathrooms are plush and the same buildings house well-equipped laundries. The men behind it all are former Queensland property developer Joe Sackerson and Sydney civil engineer Tony Atkinson. They are spending $1.2 million to ensure that when the first 100 sites are completed in five weeks' time, they will be the best and most modern in the Hunter Valley. People now who travel, they're looking for comfort and um, and they're looking for a bit of quality. It's not as popular as stamp collecting or as convenient as coins, but beer can collecting does have its own devoted following. 65 diehards from throughout New South Wales travelled to Newcastle yesterday for the Collectors Club meeting. The Australasian Club, yes there is one, boasts 1100 members. The object of all collectors is to swap, swipe or sweet talk into their possession as many different cans as possible from throughout Australia and overseas. Collector Kent Murrells owns 4,000 beer cans. He has built up a number of overseas contacts who provided him with cans from Quebec, Canada, Japan, East and West Germany. In fact, just about every beer producing country in the world. There are sporty cans, commemorative cans, provocative cans, even appropriately enough, a beer can for St. Patrick's Day. To Kent, finding a rare can is as good as winning the lottery. He says the appeal of his hobby can be explained in this way. Well, the contents are interesting and the, uh, the outsides are colourful and bright and uh, they're put out for different different reasons. It's just an interesting hobby actually. Now I notice it's mainly empty cans that you collect. What happens to the contents? What contents was that? It may have been a novice Frankly, handicap by name, but going on the stunts that followed the start, Adiora, it was the far one from that. On the ten, they sit. Racing this time in the final event, can't tell you from the outside, inclined to gallop at the start, and Jared Chait and driven solidly early, was up searching for the early lead from Perfect Retreat. Oh, there's a fall at the judge the first time. Now, by Tyrolean Brigade's come down, now Nick Adioro. Looking more closely, we can see Tyrolean Brigade falter and fall. Its driver, Ken Halverson, crashing into the team of Truant Flight and Tony Northam. Northam seemed to then just float through the air and fall comfortably 
Into the lap of Kevin Considine, the reinsman of the 5 to 4 equal favourite, Nico De Oro. Well, I seen the uh, number two horse falling, and I just moved my horse to the outside. And then all of a sudden, Tony's come out and landed in my gig. Must have been a surprise. Was, yes. What would have happened if um, perhaps he'd fallen in front of you? Well, if it had happened a split second earlier, I just would have ran over him. He so was just lucky. He was lucky, you were lucky. You continued with the race there, but didn't get anywhere? No, I had to pull him up because um, the extra weight might have slowed him down a bit. Yeah. A great catch. Any chances of trying to sign up for the cricket team? I don't think so. <laughs> The 12 by 6 metre flag seems to flow in the breeze, a distinctive and eye-catching feature of the Sir Francis Drake Motor Inn on the highway north of Hexham. Although it's difficult to miss, the significance of the flag's design is not so obvious. It was a, uh, originally designed for Queen Elizabeth I in England uh, as a standard flag for her in uh, 1555. Um, that was the period of Sir Francis Drake. Painstaking attention to historic detail is a feature of the motel, yet the $4,000 flag goes one step further. It's the work of Southern Cross Flags in Newcastle who made the perfect replica of the 16th century standard after months of careful research. Although impressive by any standards, manager Jeff McElwain says the flag is strictly for fun. Do you think it would give the new design for the Australian flag a run for its money? I wouldn't like to comment on that, now. gymnasts are all in the Australian tumbling squad. Considering there are only 14 members throughout Australia, the Waratah Club is well represented. Julia Clark, Brian Devonshire, Elizabeth Heslop, Linda Mooney and Calm NG will be trying out for the Australian team over Easter. According to coach Keith Giddy, the teenagers stand a very good chance of gaining selection. These kids are the best in Australia. Um, two of them were in the top three last year at the Australian Championships and the others are very close to them. Brian, or three of them, won Australian Championships last year. What do you think of their chances of getting into the Australian team? Well, I really believe that at least four of them will get in and with a bit of luck, five of them will all get in. But I would feel quite confident that four of them will make it. If successful at the trials, the gymnasts will compete in the World Championships in Paris this October. Pelican Bowling Club ceased trading at 8 o'clock last night and after the months of industrial action it was a quiet affair. Club secretary and licensee John Chilcott chose only to say negotiations are continuing to try and keep the club in business. Although the club may have ceased trading, its doors will stay open to its 420 members, many of whom found last night a sad affair. Afternoon. When the last game of bowls at Pelican Bowling Club. Was it a sad moment for you? Yes, very sad. What will the closure of the club mean to you? Well, it means a lot of enjoyment and to a lot of other people, and I'm very sad about it. A meeting of shareholders will be called in early April to consider the future of the club. Heritage Week kicks off early in Newcastle this Friday with the opening of an exhibition at the Cooks Hill Galleries. Called the Historic Homes of the Hunter, it features the works of artist Greg Hansel. All of the buildings depicted in Hansel's distinctive pastel colours are from the Hunter Valley and include Tokal Homestead, the Bridge House, Closebourne and Windermere at Maitland. 
The exhibition was organised in conjunction with the National Trust and timed to coincide with Heritage Week. The theme of Heritage Week this year, however, is train travel. And to that end, a number of events involving trains have been arranged, including an Upper Hunter Heritage wine tour this Sunday. Sarah Maitland is the administrator of the National Trust in the Hunter region. We really expect a marvellous day for that. That's the official start to Heritage Week. And we will be taking, say, hopefully 300 people up there. And uh, we will return to Broadmeadow at 6.30 in the evening. Is Heritage Week going to be a lot of fun this year? Heritage Week is tremendous. It takes a lot of organisation, a lot of work, but more and more people want to jump aboard. Therefore, we are very, very lucky in having a tremendous area to be in. And what better way to see it than by train? As well as officially launching Heritage Week, the National Trust's train trip will provide avid rail users with a foretaste of Maitland City Council's contribution to Heritage Week, a steam train festival, on the following weekend. Gold Cup Day at Gosford. The huge crowd was taking advantage of the fine weather and the new facilities. And being a special day on the racing calendar, the day's activities had a festive flavour, led off by the New South Wales Police Brass Band. But for most, the highlight of the day was the quest for this, the $50,000 Gosford Gold Cup. Sentimental favourite was last year's winner Riverdale, the top weight. Closely followed in the odds by Colour Page, Sea Pictures and the Newcastle train Sprightly Native. As barrier time approached, the betting ring swelled with eager punters, all hopeful the local top weight could repeat last year's performance. But as the race progressed, not even the gallant Riverdale could make it two in a row. Riverdale's in front, but they've got him. They've got him covered. C Pictures has dashed up on the outside with Colour Page. Riverdale won't give in. Sprightly Native is coming home well, but C Pictures and Colour Page, the stable mates, they fight it out and go to the line. There's not a nose between them. But I think C Pictures, I think C Pictures by a breath to Colour Page. Victory. Trainer of first and second past the post, Brian Mayfield Smith, had nothing but praise for his horses and riders. Through the race, they had both horses had a perfect run for them. So if they couldn't have won, well, you couldn't blame the jockeys. And Riverdale, what a fighter! Yeah, well, Riverdale was a victim of circumstances. It probably brought him undone, but he, you know, he put up a tremendous effort under the weight. order was placed on the old manse the day after Maitland City Council approved its demolition. The 135 year old building is the property of the Catholic Education Office and the ground it occupies is required to extend the playground of a Catholic high school. The heritage order was placed on the building by Mr Justice Hope, the chairman of the Heritage Council of New South Wales. He has 28 days from last Wednesday in which to give reasons to the state government why the building should be preserved. This may result in a two-year interim order or a permanent conservation order being placed on the manse. The Catholic Education Office this week declined to comment on the moves to stop it from demolishing the building. Points in the match were scored in the first half, with five tries to Lakes United and four goals, to two tries and one goal to the Cheetahs. It was the second half, though, of mistakes with the ball going to ground far too often. Lakes must be happy with good wins they were without six first graders, away with the representative side for the country championship in Stand in fullback Stephen Drinkwater had a big day with a try and four goals, while halfback Nick Sullivan won the card of Toyota at the end of the match. Jeez, I can't. In Australia, there are seven Ukrainian Catholic parishes with more than 20,000 followers. 
Today, the Ukrainian church in Adamstown was paid a visit by the highest clergyman in the order, His Eminence Cardinal Lubachevsky. The Archbishop's month-long trip from Rome to Australia is threefold. As well as meeting the people of the church, his visit will bring up-to-date news of the state of the church in the Soviet Union, where there are more than six million Ukrainian Catholics unable to practice their faith freely. More importantly, preparations will be made for the 1,000-year anniversary in 1988 of Christianity in Ukraine, which will also coincide with the local celebration of the first immigrants who arrived in the Hunter region nearly 40 years ago. Celebrating the service this morning with the Archbishop was the eparch of the Ukrainian Church in Australia, Bishop Ivan Prashkal. Hello, I'm Mark Warren. While talks were being held today in Sydney to try and avert a further seven-day strike by miners, a leading figure in the coal industry was in Newcastle. Jack Wilcox, chairman of the Joint Coal Board and Hunter Valley Coal Chain Council, told leading businessmen there was a greater need for communication in the coal industry. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. adolescent years can be the most difficult and these young performers aged between 14 and 17 would be the first to agree. The cast of Do You Love Me devised their own script to highlight the uncertainties of teenage love and relationships and the confusion and pressure surrounding sex. The show has been developed since December with the help of director Barney Langford. Barney took the original idea for the show from teenage romance novels and magazines which he says present an idealised and Americanised view of teenage romance. For the cast, it's an opportunity to explain their views to the adult world. The idea was to say to our parents, um, take us seriously and listen to us, and to say to our peers, don't categorise us, basically. Yeah. Do, you, do you think parents have misconceptions about young people and sex and love and that sort of thing? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, I think they just don't remember much about what used to happen. And we're just sort of trying to show them so that they can understand us a little bit more. Do You Love Me opens at the Wood Street Theatre tonight and plays every Wednesday, Friday and Saturday night until the 3rd of May.